from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to speak about a blind man in the Bible that came in contact with Jesus. It's found in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Beginning with verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. But there are many people today that are just like that. I read the other day that there are 42 million people in the world who are blind. Health authorities estimate that from all causes, half a million children become irreversibly blind around the world each year. And this is a great tragedy, and many people and countries and health agencies are working to turn it around. A tragedy of equal or greater proportion, though, is the spiritual blindness that people have. Because the Bible says you have two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes in which you can see, and you have spiritual eyes. And you can see physically, but you may not be able to see spiritually. And spiritual blindness affects everyone in this audience. There are thousands of people here tonight that you can see me up here, but you are spiritually blind. And it's a blindness that keeps you from really knowing God. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man. And he came out of uh, the little place where he had spent the night. And he never had any hope that he'd ever be able to see. And he would go outside the gate of Jericho and he would beg from the people that passed by. People on the way to market or people coming to their business that day. And he would say, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. He had his cane. He had an old shaggy coat. He'd begged some bread from a woman as he had gone on his way and he got some milk. And there he sat with other blind people and other beggars. And they were begging, hoping that the people would throw them a little bit of money or give them something. And so I look at Bartimaeus and I see myself or I see you. The Bible says he is blind spiritually. And our world leaders are groping. I listen to some of these things on television from some of our world leaders, and I'm amazed at the spiritual blindness. And I have talked to some of them privately, and, and I, I just, I, I want to reach over and grab them and shake them and tell them that they need Christ because Christ could go open their eyes. And I think only the, the true believers really know what's wrong with the world because what's wrong with the world is a spiritual problem. Now, this Bartimaeus could not see his rags. He couldn't see his filth. He couldn't see even beauty. And from time to time, we read of someone living in a house or apartment that's filled with empty containers and refuse and garbage. And the person living there may appear to lead a perfectly normal life. And they're well-dressed. I know a home like that right now where the lady is well-dressed, uh, the husband is, is a doctor, and they are respectable. They're fine people. And when you see them out, you, you think they're the most wonderful couple in the world. But if you ever get into their house, it is a mess. It looks like a hog pen. And that's the way it is with so many of us. We appear all right on the outside, but down in our hearts and in our souls, we know that something is wrong. And for some reason, the person doesn't seem to even care. The scripture says, but the natural man, that's the ordinary man, the man before he comes to Christ, 
receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it seems foolish for me to stand here and tell you that because Jesus Christ died on a cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, that that can have an impact on your life today and now and give you assurance and peace and joy that you never knew before and help settle many of the problems and relationships that you face and give you a burden for your fellow man. But it's true. And some people would call that foolish. The Bible says that the pro proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. You see, you are blinded by the God of this world. Now, who is the God of this world? Jesus called him the devil, the prince and power of the air, the prince of this world. There's another force in the world. And that other force has supernatural power too, and that other force is the devil. And there is a conflict going on, the conflict of the ages between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. You say, why does God allow that? That is a great mystery. It's a mystery as to where the devil came from. Now, the Bible tells us in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. It also tells us in the 14th chapter of, of Isaiah. We get a little picture of it, and we get other pictures and glimpses throughout Scripture. But there is a devil. Now, he's, he doesn't rule in hell. He's never been to hell. He's alive. He's settled on this planet. Now, you can call evil anything you want to, but we all know that there's evil in the world. And we all know that something is wrong, but we don't know what. Now, the Bible tells us that back of it all is the devil. You say, but why doesn't God kill the devil and get it all over with? Well, someday God is going to do just that. He's not going to kill him. He's going to throw him into the lake of fire. But that day hasn't come yet. But the devil has already suffered a great defeat. And there's been a great victory by God at the cross. The cross looked like a defeat for God, but it was actually a defeat for the devil. And you and I can enter into the victory that Christ won at the cross when we come to know him. But till then, the God of this world has blinded our eyes, so our eyes are supernaturally blinded. And that's why only the Holy Spirit can lift those blindfolds that are on your eyes just now. He was not only blind, this man, but he was poor. And we read about the poverty in the world today, and it breaks our hearts. Many of us are suffering tonight from spiritual poverty. And then this man was not only blind and poor, but he was helpless. Bartimaeus expected to die in his blindness. No one could heal that kind of blindness. But there was a ray of hope to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had heard many rumors of this stranger from Galilee that was going up and down the country healing people and helping people and preaching to people. And he heard the approach of a great crowd of people. His ears were very keen and he could hear them. He heard the children. He heard the people talking among themselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would tell him. And the crowd was getting closer and closer. And he grabbed the skirt of a fellow that was passing by and he said, tell me, who is this passing through town? And this stranger that no one knows his name turned and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And Bartimaeus thought to himself, Jesus of Nazareth, I've heard about him. I've heard that he can heal people, that he can help people. Maybe he could help me. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying and the Holy Spirit has been working and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour and what a moment for you to come. This stranger gave him the message, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I remember the story of the Surgeon General of Portugal, a former Surgeon General, and he was walking down the street one day and a piece of paper stuck to his foot. He went home, he pulled it off of his shoe and looked at it, and it was a gospel tract, and he decided to read it, and he read it. And to make a long story short, he was converted to Christ and became a great Christian leader and a great Bible teacher. Just a simple little witness like that. God can use all of those things, and that's why we ought to always be faithful in our witness, because you never know when that waitress in the restaurant or that person that you meet at your work They'll watch your life, of course, to see if you're backing it up 
by the way you live. Jesus has been passing by in Hamilton. Jesus has been passing by in the Golden Horseshoe. He may be passing by in your home. He may be passing by in the room that you occupy at a hotel. He's passing by here in southern Ontario. And in desperation, Bartimaeus cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And the other beggars said, close your mouth, close your mouth. The magistrates will hear about this and they'll come and put us in prison. But he kept on crying out. This was his one moment. This was his one chance. Jesus was there and he was going to take advantage of it. And the others said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear anything from a poor old beggar like you? But the more they rebuked him, the more he cried out. And I want you to notice several things about it. First, he cried for the right thing. He cried for mercy. He needed other things. But the thing that he needed most of all was Christ. He needed God. Have mercy upon me, you son of David. Have mercy upon me. That's what we all need tonight is God's mercy. Mercy. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to say, Lord, uh, I want justice. If I get justice, I'm going to end up in hell. I want mercy. And God has offered his mercy from the cross. And he says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from every sin that you've ever committed. You'll never have to face the judgment. You will never be in danger of hell if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, first of all, I am a sinner. You have to say that to yourself and maybe to others. Just like an alcoholic. Before you can help an alcoholic, you, they have to be willing to say, I'm an alcoholic. Before you can help in drug addiction, you have to say, I am a drug addict. I need help. And when you come to Christ, you must say, I am a sinner. I need help. And oh, Lord God, please help me. And then the second thing, not only did he cry for the right thing, but he cried to the right person. He cried to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one in all the world that could help him, stood right there. And all of his hopes were centered in him. The Bible says none other name is given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And this man, Bartimaeus, was coming in the right way. He was coming to the right person. He was coming to Jesus, the Son of God. And he cried at the right time. Jesus was passing by. Suppose he had waited and said, I'm going to see what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to say about him. I'll wait till he comes to Jericho again. Jesus never came to Jericho again. He may never come in this way again like this. When will we ever see a sight like this in Hamilton again? It's been a long time since this many people came and heard the gospel and so many people worked and prayed and believed as they've done here. And the churches united and cooperated as they've done. And God has been speaking and many people have been finding Christ and tonight you can find Christ. No, he called. At that moment, the Bible says, He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. In other words, when you hear the gospel and do nothing about it, it hardens your heart a little bit more. The God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to speak to you, but you can't hear him because you get deaf. The Bible says, He from his joined to his idols, let him alone. There comes a point. I don't know where it is or when it is, but there's a point beyond which you can go that your heart is so hard that even though God will still speak, you cannot hear. So come now while you have a, an opportunity. The great governor Felix was trembled when Paul was speaking to him about the gospel. And he said, go your way, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment. That was his hour before God, and he didn't take advantage of it. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. There may never be a tomorrow for you. This may be the moment for you. He that hardened his neck, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off. 
Notice how Jesus met his need. Here was a great crowd of people, and we have a, a way today that we think in terms of great crowds. There's a great crowd here tonight, 18,000 people, I'm told. And we think in terms of crowds. We think in terms of filling out churches and filling an auditorium or having a big crowd at a ball game. We think in terms of crowds. But it's interesting, not only did Jesus preach to the crowds, but the greatest sermons I think he ever preached were to individuals. He stopped and stood still when this blind man called him. A great crowd of leaders were around him. He could have said, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. But he stopped on his way to the cross to hear this beggar's cry. He stopped dying on the cross in order to hear that thief say, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He stopped when a woman touched his garment. And Jesus will stop for you tonight. Because you see, he sees you tonight as though you're the only person in all the world. He doesn't see you as a part of this great crowd. He sees you as you are. He knows all of your thoughts and all of your intents and all the struggles that's going on inside of you. And the Bible says he loves you and he died for you. And if you had been the only one in the whole world, he would have died for you. And Jesus not only stopped, but he said, call him. The scripture says in Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost psychologically, spiritually. You're lost. You need somebody to find you and put their arms around you. That's what he'll do for you tonight. And there was a surprise on the face of the people in the crowd to call that poor old blind beggar filthy and dirty. The first time anyone, I suppose, had ever called him. Someone threw his cloak about him. Someone gave him his cane. He threw them both away and came running and fell down before Jesus. And Jesus asked him a strange question. He'd been blind all these years, and Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord. And that word Lord means that at that moment he had received Christ into his heart. My very own Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I think he was talking not only about his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes as well. Scientists believe that 33 million of the 42 million blind people in the world either can be cured or their blindness could have been prevented. Spiritual blindness cannot be prevented. It's caused by sin and we all have it. But it can be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open your eyes and he can open your eyes tonight. What is your need? What do you want Christ to do for you tonight? What do you want me to do, he said. Some of you say, I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to give me assurance and so that I can know that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. I want peace. I'd like to rededicate my life. I've been baptized or I've been confirmed, but somehow I don't have that personal relationship with Christ and I don't have that walk with him that I ought to have and I'd like to have that. And so I'd like to reconfirm my confirmation vows, whatever it is. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Not money, not good works, but your faith has made you whole. Last December, an 18-year-old student pilot named Kim was making a solo flight cross-country when she became lost in a storm. She couldn't see anything out the windshield of her small plane. She didn't know where she was or how to get out of the storm and back to the safety. Something had gone wrong with one of her instruments. So she reached for her radio and made contact with a local air traffic controller, and she said, I don't know where I am. I need some help. Please, please help me. The controller located her on his radar screen and began talking her down toward a nearby airport where the weather was good. She couldn't see a thing, but he could see her on the radar. He knew where she was, which direction she was headed, where she needed to go, and the best way to get there. She trusted her life to a man she had never seen, whose name she did not know, and he got her out of the storm and safely to ground. Tonight, 
you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the word of God, the Bible. And then the scripture says, and immediately, immediately he received his sight. For some people, it's that quick. For other people, it's a period of time in which you're convicted of the Spirit of God and you grow gradually into the knowledge. But there comes a moment when you make that step from death to life, from darkness to light. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. And if you have any doubts about it in your heart, make your commitment tonight. Did you know that each night we've been here, we've seen more than 700 people both nights, each night come to Christ and come and make a commitment? And what I'm going to ask you to do is what we've done all over Latin America, all over Europe, all over the Orient, all over America, all across Canada. We've asked people to get up out of their seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, symbolically, I need Christ. I want his mercy. I want his love and his grace. I want to know him for myself. Why do I ask you to come forward and make that a public declaration? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly for you. He didn't do it in private. He did it publicly. And people were against him, sneering at him. He was naked and bleeding. And he did it publicly. And he said, that if we're not willing to confess him publicly before men, he will not confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. It's a public commitment. And I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. And after you've all come and stand here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some, a book that you can take home with you to help you in your Christian growth. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you're in a bus, they'll wait. And you people in the other auditorium or the other room that could not get in here, you can get up and come and the ushers will let you in this building so that you can join those that are going to come. And from the balcony, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought the first night. It's going to take at least three minutes for you to come. So get up and start now. But don't let a little bit of time keep you back and don't let the big crowd keep you back. You just get up and come because it's you before God tonight the most important commitment that you have ever made. And if you want to bring a friend with you, bring your friend. But get up and come and don't let anything keep you back. We're going to wait and people are going to be praying all over this great Colosseum as you come. You'll never have another moment quite like this. You come. We're going to wait right now. And after you've come, I'll speak to you. As you can see, many hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make Jesus Christ their Savior and trust Him as Lord. You too can make that decision. There's a phone number on your screen right now that you can call for spiritual help and counseling. Make that call now. Special friends are standing by waiting to talk and to pray with you. You that have been watching by television, you can see that here in southern Ontario, God has been speaking mightily to hundreds of people, and hundreds have already come, and still are coming. And you can make that commitment where you are, and say yes to Jesus Christ. He'll come into your heart. He'll forgive your sins. He can make you a new person. You can have a transformation right now in your life. Surrender your life to him. And if you will, pick up the phone and call that number that you see on that screen. There are people that are standing by. And if you get a busy signal, call back a few minutes later. You'll get 
you'll get through because there are hundreds of lines. And be sure and go to church next weekend. You can still call the number on your screen and make your decision for Jesus Christ right now. If the line is busy, simply write the number down and call later. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. We do want to help you, so call the number now. We hope that you'll make your plans to join us again tomorrow night for the next in this series of programs from Hamilton, Ontario. Our special guests will be Sheila Walsh, David Lambeer, Myrtle Hall, and George Beverly Shea. Mr. Graham's sermon is entitled, Time to Come Home. So plan to join us tomorrow night and invite a friend to share the telecast with you. Now for Billy Graham and all the team, this is Cliff Barrow saying good night, and may the Lord richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you. I want you to turn with me tonight to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel and the 24th verse. The sixth chapter and the 24th verse. These words, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to make a choice. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You know, there's a psychological vacuum in America tonight. Millions have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. They want a cause to believe in. They want a song to sing and they want a flag to follow. Ernest Hemingway once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug into. Irvin S. Cobb once said, in politics I'm a Democrat in religion, I'm an innocent bystander. I remember a story that they used to tell out of the American Civil War. One man said, I'm neutral. So he put on gray trousers and a blue coat, and they shot at him from both sides. 
Christ never allowed people to be bystanders and spectators. The word Christian is from the Latin and it literally means partisan for Christ, a partisan for Christ. You know, they're having all that trouble down in Yugoslavia and Mr. Tito died some time ago and left a vacuum in that country and his people that followed him in fighting the Nazis during the war were called partisans. I rem I'm old enough to remember that myself. And they were called partisans and they committed themselves. They believed in something. And those partisans never play at neutral. They never play at safe. They never sit on the fence. They are never spectators in the struggle of their times. They take sides. They commit themselves. I heard one in Texas, they asked this man, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian in the early days was used in derision. It was a term of reproach. Many people have a wrong idea about what a Christian is. They think that a Christian is a person who prays, who lives by the golden rule, who is sincere, who goes to church, and who keeps the Ten Commandments. All those are good things. They're products many times of being a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't really make you a true follower of Jesus Christ. A Christian is one that three things has taken place in his life. First, he has made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice and it affected the whole human race because they sinned against God and that became a disease that went from generation to generation and you and I have a disease that's going to end in physical death and spiritual death unless we, return, unless we turn to Christ. Every choice we make affects other people. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, 30th chapter, Moses called upon the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose. Joshua, the 24th chapter, Joshua said to the people, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I'm asking you tonight to make a choice. You have, many of you have a choice to make. I talked to a man on the telephone this afternoon and I asked him straight out, will you receive Christ as Savior? He said, not now, I'm going to think it over. I have too many questions to ask. And he made a choice, but he said, I'll watch on television and I'm praying that he'll make the right choice. In 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah said to all the people, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord God be God, follow him. If the devil is God, serve him. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Think of it. Jesus said it's a narrow gate, it's a narrow road for eternal life and only a few people are going to find it. Most of the people are going to be on the broad road that leads to destruction and judgment and hell. Which road are you on tonight? You have to make that choice before you leave here. And then secondly, a Christian is a person who has made a change, a change in the way you live. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive Christ and he gives you the power to change your whole way of life. The scripture says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind, your emotions, your will are all involved in that change and it affects your whole life when you come to Christ. Many people have made statements about this very thing. Thing. Freud said people change by renewing their fixations. Adler, the great psychiatrist, used to say people change by renewing their goals. Rollo May used to say they change by renewing their efforts towards self-realization. But God says people change by renewing their minds. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. When you come to Jesus Christ, you don't commit intellectual suicide. You come to Christ with your mind 
and you change your mind. And that's repentance. You change your mind toward God. You change your mind toward sin. You change your mind toward yourself. And you change your mind toward your neighbor. And you begin to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible is very clear. To change from a defeated, problem-oriented person depends on first changing the mind because our problems, emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in Christ. The third thing, a Christian is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of you are looking for a challenge? If any man will come after me, the first thing he must do is deny self, your own selfish ambitions, your own self goals, and you must come to the cross where Christ died for you and shed his blood. Because you see, you and I are sinners. We've all broken God's law and we deserve judgment. We deserve hell. We're going to end up in hell. We're going to end up at the judgment. But Christ came on the cross and by his stripes we are healed. When they took those long leather thongs with steel pellets and beat him across the back, he was doing that for you. When they put those nails in his hands, he was doing it for you. When they put that spear in his side, he was doing it for you. He went to hell for you. He took your judgment and your hell so that you'll never have to spend one minute in hell and you'll never have to face the great judgment of God. That's how much God loves you. God loves you. But he rose again. We don't worship a Christ who's still on a cross. We worship a living Christ. That's what Easter is all about. But God says that if you're to follow him, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. Every morning when you get up, you take up your cross. Now, what is your cross? The cross is the fact that Jesus went out to die on the cross. It was like saying, take up the electric chair and follow me today. Take up the gallows and follow me. You identify yourself with Christ openly and publicly and you're not ashamed of Christ. That's what it means. He would walk down the street and people, and he would call men and they would follow him. Now, some young people here tonight resist the idea of choice of any sort. We've been called the generation of the uncommitted. You don't want, you, they don't want to be called narrow. They don't want to close their minds. Christ taught clearly that there are two roads, two masters and two destinies. We cannot travel both roads, so we avoid the choice as long as we can. There's death in every choice. You die to one road when you go down the other. Life never allows neutrality without exacting a price. Try to be neutral in politics, and one day you'll be confronted with the ballot box. Try to be neutral about the race problem, and it'll, you'll be confronted in your block, in your neighborhood, or on your street, or in your school. And someday, it will come to you. You can't be non-involved in the issues of our day and the social problems of our day. You can't be involved with the thousands of people that walk the streets of King County with no place to sleep and nothing and very little to eat. We have to do something about it. That's the reason we have love and action. We know we can't feed all the hungry people, but we do it as an example as to what churches ought to be doing all the time. We ought to be extending a helping hand to help all of those that are in need. Some people don't want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. There's a time, though, when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus Christ demands that you decide, decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. You have to make a decision about Christ. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
And Simon Peter answered and said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Now some are reluctant to make the choice for Christ because of theology. Uh, you don't want to accept uh, all the things that the Scripture teaches about God and about Christ, even about God Himself. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says God is a God of love. And then there comes the Bible. What am I going to do about the Bible? I can't accept the Bible. Job says, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. I don't ever spend five minutes wondering whether this is the Word of God or not. I accepted this by faith years ago, and I've never had a doubt about it since. When you accept it by faith, Nothing can move you. There are things I don't understand in the Bible. There are things that are almost apparent contradictions, but they're not. I just accept it as God's Word by faith. My problem is not the things I don't understand in the Bible. It's the things I do understand. Things that I do understand that I ought to be doing in obedience to Christ. That's what disturbs me. And then there are a lot of young people that say, well, I've heard about conversion and you want us to be converted? Yes, because Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does conversion mean? It just means turn around. I'm going this direction. I turn and I start this direction in my life. That's conversion. Just changing over. That's all it means. Don't make a big thing out of it. But it is a big thing because it depends your eternity depends on whether you've been really converted or not. You have to be converted inside, in your heart, not just the outward things. Many people think you're a good person because you go to church, you've been baptized, or maybe you've been confirmed in your church. But you need to come and reconfirm your confirmation vows. You need to come and reconfirm the baptism vows that you took or the baptism vows that your parents took. You need to come and make Christ real in your own life. And then some refuse Christ because of the church. How many times I hear the word, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there's hypocrites in every area of life. I was born red on a dairy farm and we sold milk. And we would distribute the milk to the various customers and we'd get up early in the morning and uh, send our little dairy trucks out and I would milk the cows, and sometimes I'd go on the truck. And uh, we had several dairies in our area, and so the, when price of milk got so low, the farmers began to put water in the milk. Now, they were hypocrites in the milk business, but that did not mean that they were not some real ones. My father would never stoop to such a thing as that. Now, the one requirement for membership in the church is that you are unworthy to be a member. Christ himself founded the church. The church is made up of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. There's no such thing as a perfect church. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it becomes imperfect. The church is for fellowship. The church is for strengthening our faith. The church has many things that it can contribute to you. But there's another reason that we sometimes say we don't want to come to Christ. We don't want to pay the price. If you want an education, you'll deny anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of things to attain it. Now, God gave the very best he had for you. The Scripture says he spared not his own son. The Scripture says the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then there are other young people that are afraid of being misunderstood and ridiculed, do not want to be in such a small minority. The Bible teaches that there may be persecution. There will be. You will be misunderstood. You will be an outsider in many groups. And, and peer pressure is so powerful today. 
in the various school levels, whether it's the university or whether it's the high school. The Bible teaches that you may be an outsider and you may have to seek some new friends because one of the things that happens is when you come to Christ, you enter a whole new social world and you will find that you will have brothers and sisters in every country of the world. It's a great fraternity that we join when we come to Christ. And it may not be just Episcopalians or Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostalist or Presbyterians or Catholic. It may be we just are Christ ones. I've been all over, the, well, not all over the world, but many parts of the world, and I've met people that were absolute strangers to me, but the moment we met, we were brothers. You might not be invited to certain parties. You might not be invited to certain things, and you may have to pay a price for a little while till you make new friends among believers. To follow Christ may be costly business, but the Apostle Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a part of the cost. It's not easy to follow Christ in 1991 in America. It's hard. It costs something. And then there are many young people that just put it off. You say, I'm going to wait till another time. Proverbs 27 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day will bring forth. The Scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Lillian Roth's story in her book, I'll Cry Tomorrow, at a certain point she had this to say, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. You need to say tonight, I have sinned against God and I need help. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be sure if I died now that I would go straight into heaven. Will you say that tonight? And if you're not certain of your relationship to Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to make sure so that you can leave here and say, I know that Christ lives inside of me. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to get up out of your seat and say that. You must make that commitment. Don't sit on the fence any longer. Just stand out and say, I'm coming. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw that we were going to be in Sheffield, England for a crusade. And he said, I don't know anything about God, but I ought to hear that man. So he came. He did, and he accepted Christ, and he told his counselor, I almost died without faith. When we went one of the places, I forget, some city, there was a 16-year-old girl that gave her life to Christ, and the next night she found her counsel and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. George Williams, who founded the YMCA, came to Christ in the 19th century in England's West Country, and he wrote this, I cannot describe to you the joy and the peace which flowed into my soul when first I saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that they were all forgiven. Do you know Christ? Are you certain of it? If there's a doubt in your heart and mind, make sure tonight. I read the life story some years ago of Francisco Pizarro. It brought back to mind today when I was reading about the trouble they're having in Peru. In the 16th century, he conquered Peru. In the midst of great difficulties, when he only had a handful of men left, he drew a line with his sword on the ground. One way was to Peru with riches and danger, and the other was back toward Panama where their ships were and security. He chose to march south to Peru and became the founder of that great nation. Tonight, you stand at the crossroads of your life. You step across that line that has been drawn in the sand by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, repent of your sin. Be converted. Come to me. I will change your life. I'll make you a new person. I'll give you new power, a new joy a new peace, a new happiness. 
I'm going to ask you to come. And by coming, you're saying, I open my heart and give my life to Christ. I want a change in my life. Get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave, please. Hundreds are coming forward to respond to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and to pray with you about this most important decision, so please don't wait. Make that call now. If the line is busy, write the number down and call again later. I want to say a word to you that have been watching by television. You have been here in Seattle, Washington with us in this great King Dome, one of the great stadiums of the world. And we've seen hundreds of people come to Christ tonight, simply not knowing all about it, but coming to offer themselves to Jesus Christ and praying and hoping that there'll be a change in their lives. There will be with Christ in their lives. You can make that same commitment where you are. You make the commitment now and say yes to Christ. He'll come into your heart and say, Lord, I want a change to take place in me, in the relations with my family, my wife, my husband, my children, my parents. I need you, Lord, and I want you to come in. He'll forgive your sin. He'll give you the assurance that you're going to heaven when you die. Give your life to him tonight. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. I know many people that have tried everything in life and they have not found satisfaction in with peace, joy, assurance, and security. And they're still searching. You'll never find peace and joy and happiness until you yield your life to Christ. You never will. You have a moment right now. 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 The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. People are searching for the answers. You must make the choice. It's urgent. We are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. patience, patience, patience. We are to watch with anticipation. Scripture says, Christ is coming when you're least expecting him. Coming as a thief. He said, be prepared, get ready. Prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. 
Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.